turned out, which is great. And uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Without you guys, we wouldn't be um, doing this great work. Uh, welcome to ICOR um, Aberdeen event of 2020-2021 technical session in February. Uh, my name is Mohammed Ijaz and I am Institute of Corrosion Aberdeen branch chair. Um, but I have got a great team behind me who is actually organizing all these good uh, events. Uh, with that, without further ado, a few um, uh, announcements on uh, if you please uh, don't mind, can you please uh, keep your mics muted so that we don't hear any background noise apart from um, any anybody who's uh, asking question or something. But on the on the question side, actually, if you don't mind, can you please put your questions uh, in QA um, in, in sorry in the chat so that human at the end will pick up the questions from our esteemed uh, presenters. And we have got uh, two um, uh, question answer pen, uh, sorry, one question answer panel, Ben and Rob. Um, I'll introduce them hopefully in, in a bit. Uh, with that, um, the events we are having um, in, in Aberdeen, um, I call branch, we are actually, once, once we went online as a webinar, we are having very well attended I call webinars. Or which are actually uh, quite well uh, advertised on icore.org slash Aberdeen. They are uh, there for any future events. Uh, what we usually do is that, that we record these uh, events. And with that, I would like to mention that this event is also recorded and would be available on YouTube, as well as uh, the resources available from this presentation would be available on our Google site. Um, and all the announcement, if you're not receiving them, please feel free to join our LinkedIn uh, group. Uh, without our sponsors, it wouldn't be uh, possible to do any sort of uh, presentations. And we are very thankful to our sponsors. Uh, as you can see there, there are quite, um, quite few names out there. And we say thanks to all. If you're not on the list, please feel free to contact us, any, anybody in the, uh, in the committee, um, just to, uh, we will just guide you in the right direction. Um, so it's probably important to know that who are in the meeting, um, sorry, in the committee, and that's all of us, about 12 of us are there uh, helping out each other to do the, um, to do the good work in Institute of Ocean and Aberdeen. And uh, quite a few names out there. Um, so if you, if you feel that if you can contact any of us, it would be great for any, any sort of information you want or if you want to um, help us in any matter. With that, in fact, it's quite, uh, it's quite right. Looking for uh, our uh, uh, future speakers you or anybody in your organization is happy to present any of the work you or anybody in the organization has done, please feel free to drop a line to Human, who is our vice chair, and uh, or you can actually send email uh, to our um, uh, admin, uh, sorry, to our, uh, to our admin or um, internal secretary, uh, sorry, uh, Nigel or Human there, or me, don't mind. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce our presenter uh, for today, uh, Rob Hardy, who is a commercial manager of uh, Trezico. And he has recently joined Trezico from Wood Instrumentation about 18 months ago. He's a keen cyclist and successful charity fundraiser. Um, and uh, he has held several previous managerial positions in industrial scientific companies, including CEM, uh, Gallen, and Kuroda. Uh, Rob holds a master's in chemistry degree from the University of Newcastle. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, request Rob to take over. Um, yep, thanks, Mohammed. Um, yeah, just to mention on the, the fundraising, I've just got a place in the London Marathon for, for this year, so I need to start training for that as well. Well done. That's great. <laughs> Who you are raising funds for? Uh, it's for it's for the Down Syndrome Association. 
so yeah, oh, my brother great. has Down syndrome, so I've always raised money for for them. So yeah, I'll have to get training, and I think it's in October this year, the London Marathon. So it's a bit later, so I've got a few months to train. <laughs> but great. yeah, I definitely, I definitely need to get started. <laughs> it's a worthy cause, actually. I would probably request everyone on the committee here, as well as anybody attending any of our um, uh, meetings, probably um, contribute. Why not? That's great. Yeah, thank you. Can you can I just check? Can you see the slides now? Yes, good to go. OK, great. Uh, OK, well, welcome to this evening's webinar and it's a pleasure to be here and, and thank you for the invitation. Um, we're going to look at um, using Traceco's patented subsea CT scanning technology in integrity and also flow assurance applications. Um, uh, so as Mohammed mentioned, my name is Rob Hardy. I'm the commercial manager for Europe, Middle East and Africa. Um, ben Metcalf is also on the line, who's our um, technology and market manager for subsea diagnostics and instrumentation. So Ben, feel free to chip in, um, but also ask any questions as we go through. I think you can type them into the chat, but also feel free to unmute the mic at the end and, and ask the question on there as well. Um, so yeah, just some background to myself. Um, my degree was in chemistry and I've spent the last 10 years or so working in commercial roles, looking at non-destructive analytical techniques. Um, my previous role as Traceco was working in industrial applications of nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. And at Traceco, I work with the subsea CT technique. So I'd kind of summarize my experiences related to taking medical diagnostic techniques and applying them to novel areas in research and, and industry. Um, so yeah, so that's me. So we'll get started. I'm hoping this will last about 45 minutes and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So I've split the presentation up into three rough parts. Um, first of all, we'll have a look at Traceco background and the technology details. The main bulk of the presentation will be the second part, which is examples and case studies of pipeline monitoring. And then finally, we'll have a look at some recent developments, as well as a brief look at the flow assurance side of the technology as well. And then we'll have some questions at the end. So just for those that are unfamiliar with Traceco, this is just a quick summary of who we are. We're currently part of the Johnson Matthey Group. Uh, we're an oil and gas services company. We also work in radiation safety across many industries. So we work a lot with tracers and radioisotopes. So that means we're quite experienced in radiation safety and can advise on that as well. Uh, we were born out of ICI in the 60s as a group looking into the use of tracers and radioisotopes in industry and, and the chemical processes. We do a lot of process diagnostic services, mainly based on gamma scanning and tracer injections, but we also do fixed instrumentation, such as density profile as well. Um, really, we're a solutions-based company, so as we go through the presentation, I would encourage you to think about any problems that you might have or any ideas that you have, and think about how the technology could be applied to, to new and novel areas as well. So we're always keen to investigate new areas and develop new techniques as well. Uh, so this is just a summary of our subsea business. Um, a big part of our work is subsea support services. And it really started with uh, flooded member detection on jacketed structures. Um, we also looked at the grout density monitoring at the installation of these jacketed structures. And that sort of started to come into play in the subsea, uh, in the offshore wind sector as well. We started to do a bit more work in that sector. Um, but the FMI is based on gamma transmission. We also use neutron backscatter technique subsea, so that's inspection of buoyancy tanks and midwater arches. Uh, moving on to the pipeline services, we do a lot in pig tracking using our sources and detectors. So on the pipeline in the image, you can see our gamma track detector sat on the pipeline. Uh, we can put sources onto pigs and track them as they move down lines. If they become stuck, we can move the detector along the line and find the position of the stuck pig. Um, we can also, if pigs don't have sources on them originally we can use our explorer um which is i don't know if you can see my cursor but the 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 rov mounted um kit at the back there is the explorer um so that can be used to find blockages and pigs that are stuck in pipelines as well uh the main focus of today's presentation is the discovery ct scanner the explorer and the discovery sort of work hand in hand most often because the Explorer can find areas of interest and then Discovery can go in and, and scan them in a lot more detail. But so, yeah, that's a summary of our subsea techniques. Looking into the technology of the CT 
scan. Um, the CT technique we're using is analogous to medical CT scanning used in hospitals. Obviously, we have a few adaptations to take it sub-C, uh, but the principle behind CT is relatively simple. The CT beam passes through a material, and the density of this material can then be calculated by how much the beam is weakened. And this is known as the attenuation coefficient of the material. Uh, different materials have different attenuation coefficients and therefore weaken the beam by different amounts. What we do is take multiple line of sight measurements across the item to be scanned, which provides multiple data points of the item's attenuation coefficients corresponding to grid points for the item. So in a complex system like a, a pipe with integrity and flow assurance issues, there are obviously a lot of materials with different attenuation coefficients, so we get a lot of data from different angles. Um, so reconstruction models then take this information and use it to generate an accurate image of the scanned item. Um, as CT uh, scanning produces a complex grid of data, it's often likened to a Sudoku puzzle, except one which can only be solved using computers and iterative algorithms. So whilst the analysis is, is quite complex, um, the advantage of the CT scan is that it's, gener it's able to generate information about the pipeline wall thickness and integrity in one scan. So you get all the data and can process it in different ways to get the integrity and the flow assurance data on a pipeline. Um, this information can then be fed into pipeline integrity management systems, enabling an operator to get the most accurate information possible on the actual operation of their pipeline at that exact location. Um, so this slide is really a, a snapshot of the technology when we take it sub C, so it's truly non-intrusive. It can scan through coatings. There's no interference to production. We get both the integrity and the flow assurance data in the same scan, and we'll see examples of this um, and how we can adjust the density scales to study different aspects of the same data. Um, the detection capabilities of the Discovery CT scanner have been developed to be similar to or better than capabilities achieved by existing inspection techniques such as magnetic flux, leakage, MFL, inline inspections, ILI, or pulse eddy contents, PEC. Um, this helps to ensure that information available to operators with complex or unusual pipeline systems is as good as that available to those with more conventional systems. Um, the information produced by Discovery has also been developed to ensure maximum possible compatibility with other pipeline inspection techniques and also integ uh, integration with pipeline integrity management systems. Uh, the system produces tomograms and we'll see a lot of those as we go through the presentation. And this is an exact image of the pipeline at that scanned location. Um, so this is the summary really of the current capabilities and the parameters, but we're always looking to expand the tool and expand the capability and expand the technology. So if anyone has any needs outside of this, then, then please talk to us and let us know. Uh, one thing to mention as well is pre-project calibrations and FATs. The system is very versatile and adaptable to different conditions and pipe sizes. And it is as adept at scanning through 50 mil of heavy concrete coating as it is a scanning through micron thick fusion bonded epoxy coating. So we have a range of qualified parameters we work within uh, as a standard. However, we can also carry out trials, FAT and calibration work as required for more unique projects. Um, so for pipelines outside of the standard range, a specific pre-job calibration is required in the same manner as a standard MFL approach for performing pre-project pull through testing. Um, the precise goal of the pre-project calibration may vary depending on the exact parameters of the pipe, uh, but typical goals for the pre-project calibration could be um, validation of anomaly characterization using defect pieces, uh, determination of sizing accuracy and standard deviation values, uh, determination of most likely features identified. Um, so there's a few reasons we might um, perform this, this sort of testing. Um, it also has additional benefits uh, for the onshore project delivery process because if we know about the the types of defects we're looking for then the reporting um and the the, the post project work is, is speeded up a lot as well so um yeah so in the project illustrated here this is kind of a um, wall thickness map um the pre-project calibration approach was successfully applied uh, we detected a small pinhole type metal loss anomaly at the bottom of the line the operator provided a representative a representative sample with similar defects which have been recovered from a pipeline failure in field. So consequently, both the analysis technique and the discovery technicians offshore were able to easily detect and size this defect. Uh, so this is just an image of um, discovery clamping onto a pipeline. So it's delivered uh, to the seabed in a basket. 
uh, work class ROV uh, then delivers it onto the pipeline. We have real time data transmission to the surface. We also have adapters um, so that we can change to different um, pipe diameters if we need to offshore as well. Okay, so why would we use Discovery for integrity inspections? Well, um, the Discovery image reconstructions are available immediately offshore, allowing for preliminary real-time assessment of the data. Uh, this includes wall thickness measurements for any identified defects, product bore analysis or deposit detection. Uh, the results can also be used by an operator to help targeted inspections. So um, it really can guide the inspection campaign as well. If, for example, an area is inspected which contains an unexpected level of buildup, an operator may choose to perform additional inspections of that location to monitor for the presence of any under deposit corrosion. Um, we don't need to remove any coatings or stop any production as well. Um, and like we said before, the pre-project calibration allows offshore technicians to determine the likely early scan indicators that can be used to confirm if a significant wall thickness variation is present at the scan location. So again, this helps to minimize the overall project duration um, for the same inspection area and the size of the operational intervention. Uh, so we'll have a look at some case studies and real world examples from the last few years. So um, we do a lot of work with concrete weight coated pipelines. So concrete weight coatings provide both additional weight and protection against damage and have proven to be popular external coating for many subsea pipelines. Unfortunately for operators of un unpickable concrete weight coated pipelines, the external coating uh, can also significantly limit the effectiveness of any external scan of the pipeline. Um, the vast majority of externally applied inspection techniques require direct contact with the pipeline metal. So previously when an operator required an inspection of a concrete coated pipe, they may have had to resort to removal of the coating in order to allow an external inspection. Uh, and there's a few issues that can occur with that, there could be accidental damage during or after the concrete removal. There's potential exposure of external pipe surface to a corrosive environment. There's reduced production whilst the concrete removal occurs. Um, there's also the repair um, and increased inspection time and cost. So uh, in this example, it's a 16 inch concrete coated pipeline. And in this instance, the client didn't want to remove any coating for the inspection. This is of course, no problem for discovery. Um, so the client benefits from a rapid scan and getting the data much quicker. Uh, so the cross-section image on the left is how the pipe actually looks. We can see the 63 mil of concrete coating, 5 mil of polyurethane anti-corrosion layer under this, uh, and below that we can see the, the pipe wall itself. Uh, the image on the right hand side is the actual tomogram obtained with Discovery. You can see that once the density scale is added and the colors um, are added in there, the interpretation becomes very intuitive and easy to visualize what's going on. Uh, you'll see that all the features are clearly visible in the tomogram. And interestingly, we can see the um, steel rebars in the concrete coating as well. Also in that image, you can see we've been able to add the wall thickness measurements uh, in various sections. Uh, and we'll see a bit more of the types of measurements as we move through the presentation as well. Uh, the graph below the pipe the cross sections uh, is actually a 360 degree wall thickness map of the pipe. So we have an average wall thickness of 14 mil as shown in the black dotted line. The continuous blue line is the discovery wall thickness data obtained and the red dots are measurements that the client obtained with UT during validation of the discovery tool and you'll notice that there's really good alignment with those. Uh, one point to note in that is the uh, increased wall thickness on the seam weld on the 360 map. Okay, so this next example, um, this was looking at a piggyback line. Um, so we had uh, a challenge of looking at this unpickable pipeline, which had a gas piggyback line above it. Um, although the presence of a piggyback line, um, piggyback pipe doesn't make the pipe itself unpickable, uh, the piggyback pipe can prevent access to a large area of the pipe uh, for the majority of externally applied inspection techniques. Um, and then couple this with a pipeline, which is unpickable by different means, for example, sharp bends, unbarred tees or heavy deposits in the line, then discovery uh, is an ideal solution for this. Uh, so the tomogram on the left shows the piggyback pipe setup. Uh, this is from a series of scans performed at the uh, Tracego facility in Billingham in the UK. Um, so piggyback systems do provide many benefits to an operator. 
uh, such as a single pipeline route. Um, but inspecting the pipe systems um, has previously been a, a bit of a challenge. There's narrow spacing between the pipes that makes it difficult for traditional techniques to perform a full 360 scan. Um, unlike traditional inspection methods, which need full access to all areas of the piggyback pipe using uh, what we were able to do with this is use a specifically designed external uh, clamp with discovery um, that could clamp around the whole system and perform a full scan of the piggyback pipes. So you can you can see um, in the images on the right hand side that we could design and construct a custom ROV clamp. This allowed us to clamp on the whole system. Um, um, you can also sort of see in the tomogram all the nuts and bolts of that device that we added on there as well. Uh, so in the tomograms, both the main production pipeline and the smaller piggyback support line are clearly visible at all positions and orientations. Uh, this meant that wall thickness and flow measurements can be taken and assessments can be performed. Um, you can see that there's quite a lot of um, wall thickness loss and anomalies identified in the, the pipe there as well. Uh, like we mentioned before with Discovery, you also acquire the assurance data at the same time. Um, the density scale can be adjusted if we need to, if there's lots of different material in there. But what was interesting in this example um, was that we were also able to identify a condensate layer that was building up in the gas piggyback line. And this could have gone on to cause some issues in the future. So just an interesting bit of extra data we got from the scan there. Um, so this is an example of a pipe in pipe inspection from the Gulf of Mexico. Again, Discovery's capability comes into play here because uh, we can produce a very detailed map of both the carrier and the production pipes, as well as both the integrity and flow assurance data. Uh, in this example, we can also see the annulus area in, in some detail. One of the po points to note is in this area is that there is a faint blue line on the outside of the carrier pipe, which is the aerogel layer. Uh, we've added quite a lot of wall thickness measurements to this image for both pipes, just to show an example of the variety of, of measurements you can take. Um, pipe and pipe systems and pipe bundles are particularly difficult to inspect by for traditional methods for a few reasons. Uh, you can't visually inspect the inner pipes from the outside. It's not possible to inspect the outer pipe from the inside due to the annulus. Um, inner pipes may be lined or manufactured from a corrosion resistant alloy. Um, there might be extra and irregular material in the pipes such as centralizers or spacers. There may also be heating elements or insulation in the way too. So. Um, so yeah, this is the piping pipe system is really ideal um, for discovery, um, and it's proven itself to be particularly adept at scanning these types of systems, providing accurate wall thickness measurements for both inner and the outer pipes, as well as being able to provide a report on the condition of the spacing between the inner pipes. Uh, looking again at some bundles, so pipe bundles present a similar level of complexity. Uh, this tomogram shows a test tank scan of a pipe bundle where uh, the various pipelines, umbilicals, and even seam welds and rust accumulation in the bottom of the pipeline can be clearly seen. Um, you'll see the several straight lines can also be seen intersecting various pipe walls. These lines are CT detection artifacts caused by uneven reduction in the beam density at positions tangential to the pipe wall. Uh, detection artifacts such as these are well known phenomenon in CT, and we have uh, several different techniques to minimize the effect of these artifacts on wall thickness analysis results. Um, although currently Discovery is only available to scan pipelines or bundles up to around 27 inches out of diameter, uh, we've done feasibility studies and we've demonstrated that it would be possible to extend the system to larger diameter pipes in the future. And that's something that's on our, our plans for the future as well. Um, um, let's move on to that. So this next one is another corrosion example. Um, this is looking at internal corrosion. Uh, this was a large diameter gas line. Uh, after a scan with Discovery, we obtained this tomogram and you can see, clearly see some instances of severe wall loss around the pipe, most noticeable at the 12 o'clock uh, and the sort of, uh, three o'clock positions there. Instances of broad wall thinning as well as some severe isolated corrosion spots were identified. Um, you can also clearly see a section at the bottom of the pipe where a, fact, uh, a layer of condensate layer is building up, which could be a contributing factor um, to the corrosion that we've seen on there. 
uh, in this next example, um, the client wanted to know more about the suspected microbial and bacterial induced corrosion in their flow line. We were able to work with the client and use their own corrosion modeling data and identify hotspots and areas of interest along the line for scanning. Uh, the tomogram here is an example of one such area where we identified um, an area of corrosion there. Uh, this case study was looking at preferential weld corrosion. Um, as part of a life extension program, the uh, discovery scanner was deployed to determine the integrity of a concrete weight coated pipeline. Uh, line was approaching the end of its original design life and physical inspection of the line was required, but it was not possible to inspect the line by conventional methods. Uh, the operator was aware of several potential failure mechanisms, such as preferential weld corrosion, and had, uh, using both corrosion and risk assessment performed prior to the inspection campaign, identified uh, areas which were considered to be highest risk of failure. Um, inevitably, a large amount of pipeline required inspection, but due to various operational issues, the operator was working with a restricted timescale. Um, although CT is usually considered a localized inspection technique, Discovery also has a fast scanning technique, which enables rapid screening of a large line and reduces the overall scan time by a factor of about five. Um, we'll go into that in a bit more detail later on, but with the fast screening um, technique here, we projected a time saving of about 80% compared to local inspections and a cost saving of about 35% as well. Um, so during the scanning campaign, the technicians quickly identified that corrosion was occurring inside the pipe and that this corrosion was uh, occurring close to the seam weld. Uh, as there are no mechanical updates needed to change discovery from a fast scan to a full sizing scan, it was possible upon this identifi uh, identification of a defect in the fast scan to immediately change to a full high resolution scan uh, and get the data for defect sizing. And again, that doesn't really affect the overall project time. Um, so consequently, the scanning campaign was completed successfully within the time scale available. Um, so yeah, I think you can see in the, um, the sort of bone up area that, you, that gives you the level of sort of detail that we can get uh, with discovery on these, um, these weld areas as well. Okay, so this case study is looking at uh, disbonded coating. Um, an operator requested that discovery was used as part of a routine inspection campaign. Uh, the pipeline to be inspected was a large diameter pipeline with a fusion bonded epoxy coating applied for external corrosion protection purposes. Uh, this was expected to be in generally good condition. Uh, previous inspections had not revealed any significant levels of corrosion or damage along the pipe. Uh, scans with discovery confirmed that general condition of, of the pipe wall was good, although it also revealed that there were sections along the pipeline where the coating had disbonded. Um, fortunately, as a scan with discovery inspects both coating and pipe conditions at the same time, it was possible to determine that there was no external corrosion occurring underneath the coating. Um, using that information, the operator has then been able to go on and, and make fully informed decision on performing the, the coating repairs. This is just um, a riser example, just to show you that Discovery is also well suited to scan in the horizontal and vertical orientation. So we can also look at riser integrity. Uh, in this case, we have multiple scans along a riser showing differing areas of, of good and, and bad condition. Um, the image on the left is an example of an area of good condition, whereas the ones on the right show major wall loss and major corrosion anomalies that were identified during the inspection. Um, this is another case study that's um, uh, from a, a project we delivered recently. Um, this was discovery being used to inspect a known leak within a coated water injection flow line. The customer wanted to map and measure the extent of the problem and plan some repairs. Visual inspection had identified um, two leaks, but the customer wanted to fully investigate other areas and guide the repair schedule. So seven inspection locations were identified. Within these seven locations, various levels of metal loss defects were identified in all of them. But in two locations, we found full through wall defects. So one point is shown here in the, the images. So there's the tomogram on the right there. And the image on the left is using the data in a slightly different way to get a 2D representation of the wall plot, uh, similar to how you would see with an inline inspection. And the black area there is showing areas of zero wall thickness. 
So this is just another way of, um, of visualizing the data from the same inspection campaign. Uh, so we're able to take the data and build some 3D models in the seven locations. So I think overall 605 scans were taken over a seven meter section of pipe. Um, so what they were, what they wanted to do was look at the data one meter up and down of the um, of the known through wall defects, and that would guide the repair clamp positioning during the repairs. Okay, so we'll move on just to look at some new developments now, and one of the more recent developments is the fast screening technique that we we referred to in a, a previous slide. So this allows real time visualization of integrity data. Uh, when screening sections of interest and can inform decisions about more in-depth scanning. Uh, so a sonogram is produced as the tool scans, which is monitored. Uh, and as you can see in the two images here, we have a lower resolution image produced after one lap and a much higher resolution one after around 20 laps. Um, although they're clearly differing in resolution, you can see that the defects that are showing up in the higher resolution one are already visible uh, in the scan after one lap. Um, so this is a relatively raw sinogram and different to the density map tomograms that we've seen previously. This data is um, presented for a single 15 mil slice and plotted as the rotational position changes. So although it, it looks like a pipe in the diagram, it's actually the data sort of building up on itself um, as the it's one static defect that's tracing throughout the data there. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's the relative position to the source and detector. So, but what you can tell from this is that you would instantly be able to identify this is an area of interest after one lap. So we could then go on to acquire the full high resolution data uh, and build the tomograms for that area. And then obviously if no defects were detected in a fast scan, the tool can step down the line onto the next section. Um, the fast scanning process has now been applied um, on scanning campaigns on over 20 different pipelines. And the overall reduction in scan time is generally between 50 to 80%, depending on the extent of any damage in the pipeline. So this is just another example. Um, so after the standard delivery and clamping of discovery, we complete the full scan and data acquisition at location one. Um, this acts as a baseline data before the inspection area. We then have an area for fast screening ahead of us, which can be up to four meters uh, in length. Um, so in this area, we're then looking for any significant variations um, or significant changes. So the process then becomes step, fast scan, monitor, decide whether it's a full scan or, or move on from there. So if there's no change from baseline, then the tool moves on until the next predetermined area for a full scan. In this case, it was a preset to perform a full scan every 20 screening scans if there was no defects detected. Uh, but if an anomaly is detected in a fast scan, then that triggers a full scan. Again, something that we've started to do more recently is baseline inspections. Um, so in this case, we worked with the operator to look at their own corrosion modeling data and determine a selection of points. Uh, once the baseline data has been acquired, discovery will then be deployed annually to monitor corrosion growth rates in these locations. Uh, we have an example of the tomogram obtained as a baseline as expected, we have consistent wall thickness measurements. However, one thing to note is that you see the position of the production pipe is not ideal. It's not sitting dead center. So that was something we could advise on at this stage. Um, Overstress and fatigue is also something we started to look at a bit more recently. So um, as you can see in this tomogram, the extent of the inner pipe movement with respect to the outer pipe can clearly be identified and measured. Um, we were also able to measure the wall thickness to within its standard stated tolerance for all positions on the inner pipe and only with a slight increase in tolerance for touching positions on the outer pipe. Um, this sample um, shows that discovery can be used to monitor pipe in pipe systems where the inner pipe upheaval buckling could be expected to occur in order to ensure the ongoing integrity and safety of the systems. Um, in this image, clearly annulus integrity has been lost, which could have been due to lack of centralization of the production pipe or damage to the centralizers. Um, the thermal expansion has then allowed this to sit right up against the carrier pipe. This will then lead to flow assurance issues as well as potential corrosion problems. So um, yeah, discovery can be used to check effectiveness of thermal expansion design as well. 
Um, this is another interesting example and quite a, a complicated system that we were able to image. Um, this was, we identified some interesting instances of, of movement and vibration within an interior gas lift riser, uh, which had the potential to cause fatigue damage. Uh, you can see from the image, this is an example of a pipe within a pipe within another pipe, with the innermost pipe being the gas lift riser. The middle is the production pipeline uh, and a heavy wall carrier pipe on the outside. You can also see that there's um, an umbilical located in the outer annulus as well. Uh, if you look closely at the gas lift rise, you can see that the image is jagged and distorted. Uh, and this is from movement during the scan. So there's a risk of fatigue damage from this movement. Uh, so based on these results, uh, we worked with the operator to do some monitoring at that location. Uh, the goal of this was to understand the slugging that was happening in the gas lift riser as this was contributing to the fatigue. Um, so the images here, the blue colour scheme image shows the initial data and you can see short areas of lighter blue before darker and repeated in quick succession. That shows slugs passing through um, in a high frequency. Uh, the operator was then able to make some slight changes in their system. We then performed a second scan with results shown in the yellow and red color scheme. Um, so what you'll see there is you can see there's larger areas of red and then small and areas of yellow. So that's slug showing up in lower frequency. Um, and so the client has been able to reduce slugging frequency and take some of the stress uh, off the gas, uh, the gas lift riser. Um, what I'll do now is I'll just move on to quickly look at some flow assurance aspects um, on that side of discovery. So with this area, we, we're focused on characterizing blockages so that the correct remediation strategies can be used first time around. So remediation attempts often fail first time, mainly due to a lack of information about the nature of the deposit or the blockage. And that's obviously expensive and, and problematic. Um, so we mentioned before that about the Explorer system, which can be used as a pipe scanning tool, which can be used to find and map uh, where blockages are and the extent and distance of them. So with Discovery, we can then use um, the system to characterize the material based on the density. So we can advise if it's asphaltines, if it's sand, scale, hydrate, or wax. And obviously each of these would need a different strategy. Uh, and often the wrong solvent strategy or remediation strategy can make things worse. So it's important that we can characterize things accurately first time. So these are just a few examples of tomograms that show the different types of blockages we can come across from quite uniform blockages to um, ones where there's different densities and there might be gas pockets within, within blockages as well. Uh, so really we're sort of looking at a four step process when we start to look at the flow assurance side. So we can locate blockages um, with the Explorer tool. We can then use discovery to quantify and characterize uh, you can then carry out a remediation strategy. We can then use discovery to monitor the progress of that remediation as well. So this is just a snapshot of the Explorer tool and, and the capability. And really it can be thought of as a, um, it's, it's, it's a gamma transmission tool. So it's, it's very similar to an X-ray kind of system. So we can scan the pipes. We can get rough idea of, of the density of the material that's in there. Um, if it's uh, the type of blockage and, and the length of it really. So um, it's a fast screening flow assurance system that then ties into discovery to do more detailed um, mapping and characterization. So this is just some example data. Um, so the, the, um, the numbers on the left are the densities, the um, the numbers on the, the bottom are the distance along the pipeline and the numbers on the right are the depth. So that the depth is, is plotted by the black line and then the orange and blue lines are the explorer density data from two different orientations of the scan. So you can clearly see we can, we can see where the areas of increased density are. Um, in this example, we had um, one instance of increased density or a blockage here. And then as we move down, further down the line, you can see that a blockage extends for quite some distance. Um, and you'll see that the this is going up a gradient as the, the depth decreases as well. And then we've also got a change in the density. So there's a different type of blockage or we could be changing from, um, 
from a wax to back to oil or something like that at this stage. So you can see that it, you can map the whole um, condition of the blockage along the pipeline and identify areas for discovery to go in and start to characterize things and give, give a bit more detail on there. Um, so again, this is just to give some examples of the different types of scans that we get for in integrity and, and flow assurance. Um, so it's an example of a clean piping pipe system and an asphaltine blockage. Uh, something else that we can also do is our um, gamma track technique, which is a flow monitoring technique where we can put radioactive sources injected into the line. We can monitor when and how the source exits the line, um, enabling for a diagnosis of the extent of a, a bore restriction as well. Uh, so just a couple more examples of blockages we've characterized. Um, information on combined flow production assurance and integrity scanning campaigns um, have been uh, published by operators Hess and Shell. In particular, the Hess presentation highlights how Discovery was able to identify a buildup of barium sulfate in the pipeline, which the operator is now successfully controlling thanks to the information provided by Discovery uh, and supported by other in-field measurements. Um, just as Discovery is able to identify the presence of buildup and blockages, uh, it's also able to identify their absence. And in one recent scanning campaign, after the project had concluded, the operator stated that based on historic modeling data, they'd been expecting buildup in their pipeline. When Discovery scans demonstrated that there was no discernible deposits present, they modified their inhibition strategy, so reducing the need for costly disposal of an environmentally unfriendly product. Uh, so this is just an example of a um, hydrate formation at seed positions and the dissociation loop as seen by discovery in a series of CT scans performed at a client's test facility. Um, so overall, this shows the, the monitoring and, and confirmation capability. But uh, at wax and hydrate are two common flow assurance threats when transported through um, uh, unprocessed hydrocarbon. Both can precipitate out of the transported product and deposit onto the line. Initially, this is decreasing the pipeline's cross-sectional area and reduces the volume of fluid able to be transported at a time, um, whilst at the same time increasing production costs as more power is required to propel the fluid along the pipeline. Eventually, that uh, can cause complete pipe bore blockages uh, and damage, either because of continued product, uh, product precipitation or due to chunks of deposit being transported along the line. Um, the end result is an increase in production costs and a restriction in the operational capacities of the line. Uh, on some lines, high product temperatures need to be maintained in order to inhibit wax and hydrate formation to minimize the risk of blockages and the need for more invasive remediation strategies. Um, maintaining the temperature also reduces risk of under deposit corrosion, which is a concern to many operators as maintaining sufficient product temperatures can be difficult. Um, under deposit corrosion tends to be very aggressive and is difficult to control by inhibitors as they cannot reach the corroding metal due to the presence of the deposit layer. Um, discovery scans can be performed on operational lines, enabling an operator to see the actual fluid flow conditions during the pipes, uh, normal operation, and quickly and easily identify any areas of water holdup, deposits, or any other uh, flow associated issues. Um, it is possible to generate an accurate recreation of the actual product flowing conditions whilst the pipeline is in operation. Like we said before, we don't have to stop production with discovery uh, and even during these monitoring um, and remediation strategies. So for an operator that has many advantages as it enables them to identify areas of concern, such as slugging, water holdup or erosion, which can have a significant impact on the operational life um, of the pipeline or its components, whilst at the same time, potentially been very difficult to identify and isolate by other monitoring techniques. Um, so yeah, so overall this just shows the, the sort of flow um, of the buildup, hydrate formation, partial blockages, and then dissociation following the remediation. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say today. So if, if we want to, we can go over to questions. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. Uh, very, very informative and interesting presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. And I, I'm i sure that uh, everyone in the audience have enjoyed as well because we have received a lot of questions in the chat oh, box. 
Uh, I'll go through them, but before that, uh, may I ask everyone, uh, at least those who have entered their abbreviations or the computer name or anything like this in the username or profile name, can you please go and rename the, uh, your username? Uh, you can just go to, to your uh, profile and the three dots and just rename. So it will uh, help us to issue your certificates uh, and prepare a register after the session. Uh, so uh, let me go to the questions and uh, please uh, don't hesitate to add more questions while, while we are going through this. Uh, we will probably have enough time to go through all of them. And Ben and uh, Rob both will be able to uh, explain. Uh, so the first question is from Graham. Uh, when you say uh, rap rapid scan, how does that compare to a UT scan on the same region? Yeah, OK. Um... If, if Ben's online, maybe I'll just back heel that to him quickly and that'll give me a chance to have a sip of my tea. <laughs> yeah, no problem, Rob. Uh, good evening, <laughs> thanks, everyone. Ben. And thanks for a brilliant presentation, Rob. You did us proud there, so that's fantastic. Um, yeah, apologies. I started answering in the chat, um, but then I, I quickly lost track as the, as the questions came in. Um, typically, um, to do a complete inspection, you know, to get sort of the 3D model of a one meter section, um, depending on the, the pipe wall thickness, typically it could take up to a shift, so eight hours to, to, to sort of fully model one meter. Um, Rob's highlighted how the, uh, the fast screening method can be used if there is no corrosion damage or no area of areas of interest, then that inspection station can be quickly sped up, uh, reductions in the order of 50 to 80% of that time. So typically you may um, complete an inspection station using the fast screening method in say a couple of hours, for example. Okay, great, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from S. Berry. Uh, are there any specific challenges when measuring the wall thickness of a concrete coated pipe with a discovery setup? Uh, I'm happy to answer that one again, Rob. Um, yeah, keep going, Ben. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. <laughs> no problem. I'm here to help, so uh, keep sipping your tea. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, in this question, no. Uh, discovery is completely non-intrusive. Um, uh, Non-contact, sorry, shall I say, and non-intrusive, I guess. So the, uh, the measurement principle, uh, it's based on gamma transmission, the, the the transmission system rotates around the pipe. Um, it then goes through a, a, a transformation as, as Rob spoke about to generate the tomogram. That procedure happens completely non-contact with the sample. So providing the uh, static part of the machine can clamp stably onto the concrete coated pipe, the rotating part of the machine performs its inspection completely in a, in a non-contact manner. Um, so the photons pass through the sample without altering the sample or doing anything to the sample at all. Just like a, a CT scan will, uh, a hospital CT scan will scan a human by the non-contact method. So no, providing the, the stator part of the machine can get a good grip on the concrete sample and hold the rotating part steady, then there are, there are no limitations on on the resulting image. Great, yeah, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Steve Patterson. How crucial is the pre-project calibration? How accurate is this system without the baseline? Um, yeah, so it, it depends if, as Rob has highlighted, if we're operating in our qualified range or if we're operating outside of the qualified range. So we have a, a recognition for asset integrity um, that providing we're operating within certain parameters and we're meeting certain transmission requirements, et cetera, then um, uh, we, we wouldn't specifically need a pre-project calibration to um, um, 
to provide the results to the recognized accuracy, typically the recognized accuracy for general wall thickness measurements. Uh, the uncertainty is around plus minus one millimeter, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So but providing it's within our qualified range, we're generally pretty confident without a pre-project calibration, we can get to those recognized limits. If there's something strange going on within the pipe or some unexpected item in the field of view that's, that's distorting the image, for example, then we may choose to do some more calibrations just to uh, verify the impact of that, that unexpected item, for example. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Stephen Tate. Uh, uh, he is thanking you for great presentation. And the question is, I assume that the scanning length is limited to clamp length, which is then relocated to the next section. Is that right? Normally by the excavation, uh, as you've seen from the image, the instrument is a, a sizable image compared to the work class ROV. Um, so normally the size of the excavation will limit the scanning length. So how far we can step up towards the edge of each side of the trench. Um, the scanning window itself is within the confines of the instrument. It's actually a 15 mil slice in the center, close to the center of the instrument. The equipment around, there's, a, there's a, a, basically a stator and a rotor inside the instrument. The, the stator contains the buoyancy, the clamping and the stepping mechanism. Hence the instrument is quite big, but the actual measurement payload in the center has a CT slice thickness of 15 millimeters. Okay. Uh, again, another question from Graham. Uh, how much dredging is uh, required to fit the tool on the pipeline? Uh, yeah. Uh, if the pipeline's buried, uh, the dredging is can be quite significant. So um, it's typically, uh, I think it was something like a, a meter below the pipeline and a meter either side, just rough rules of thumb, but it's that order of magnitude. So the, the dredging can be quite significant in um, offshore areas where the pipelines are buried. Uh, in other areas, in deeper waters where the pipelines may not be buried, we have used lifting mechanisms and lifting stands to actually pick the pipe off the seabed, put it on the stands, and then we've gone along and scanned it as you would a sort of jumper system, for example, that, that isn't resting on the seabed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, probably the next question is answered already, but I, I, I will ask it again. Uh, Question from Steve Patterson. Uh, for piping pipe and bundles, is there any loss in the accuracy for the inner pipe? Um, no, there isn't, providing we're getting enough transmission through the sample. Um, the uh, measurement principle is sort of a discrete measurement principle. So a pixel in the center of the image has equivalent resolution to a pixel towards the edge of the image. So it's a, it's a discrete method. Um, it's not a continuous method. It's sort of a digital method. Um, but a pixel in the center of the image has the same uncertainty as a pixel towards the edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and another one from Stephen Tate again. Uh, he's wondering if this uh, CT scan technology could also be applied uh, top sides for COI, version under insulation detection. Uh, yeah, the, the principle is is um, applicable to top sides as it is to, to subsea. It's applicable to pipeline manufacture to um, in this particular iteration of the instrument is just optimized or designed for, for subsea. Um, but the principle is equally uh, applicable mm -hmm. to top sides as well. Obviously, the, the limitations still apply that you need 360 degree access to the sample. Um, so the, there are some limitations around it. Sometimes top sides, pipes on pipe racks, et cetera, can be quite tightly bundled in, you know. Um, but providing we've got 360 degree access to the sample, then it, it can be inspected using computed tomography, yeah. Okay, great, Just, just to add to that one as well, mm -hmm. um, we mentioned before about subsea neutrons. We've also in the past used um, neutron backscatter for more moisture under insulation rather than corrosion under insulation. But yeah, we've also applied that technique to 
topsides and onshore um, moisture detection as well. Yeah. So the neutrons are one-sided technique. The backscatter techniques aren't the rob, whereas yeah. the tomography system is a transmission technique. So you have a source and a detector at either side, whereas the neutron is a single-sided technique that the the source and detector are uh, applied from the same side. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from uh, Mohammed Ijaz. Uh, He's thanking you for a very informative uh, presentation. And the question is, uh, what is the minimum size of defect that would be identified or picked up during a fast scan? This is important where expected corrosion is very localized. Yeah, so the measurement technique is a, is a local inspection technique, as you've seen. Uh, we're designed to be applied in areas where corrosion modeling, for example, might suspect the likelihood of corrosion damage to have occurred. Um, the detection limits are the same in the fast screening method as they are in the final tomogram. It's the same data effectively. One is just has been, uh, um, the, the image has been uh, generated through the algorithms to uh, make it easy for the human mind to visualize the image. Whereas looking at the sinogram, the raw data can be quite confusing and more difficult to interpret at times. But it is the same data, so the detection limits are the same. Um, we're generally uh, as good as MFL in terms of detection limits, so an inline MFL system. Um, typically for the smallest class of defects, sort of uh, pinholes, those need to reach a depth of say two millimeters before we can see them in the raw data and before they are reproduced in the tomogram, the image. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one is from Graham uh, Marshall. Uh, system looks very good for piping pipe flow assurance and concrete coated lines. However, due to time of scans, surely UT would give better accuracies and faster scan times and coverage. Are you, do you agree with that? Um, I think in, in certain cases I would, we, we don't offer the UT technique. We are uh, this, what we've presented today, mainly our radio isotope techniques. It's all about selecting the right tool for the job, you know. If you can get away with a conventional UT system and you don't have the challenges that, that CT will help you overcome, then of course it, it makes sense to use the conventional techniques. UT is, is more accurate. It can detect crack-like defects as we know. So where applicable, yeah, use the UT system if you can. Um, where discovery comes in is, is where it brings that extra value of either the flow assurance information or where you where you're going through a particularly difficult coating such as concrete wear coating or a piping pipe you can't actually get the ultrasonic signals to the inner pipe so that's where discovery comes in so i think i would agree with the statement yeah okay great thank you uh the next one is uh, from s berry uh, do you have a way to gauge buried pipes? Um, unfortunately, no. I wish we did because discovery would be utilized massively more than, than what it is. You know, We have looked mm. at techniques such as magnetometry and things like that. So we have experience of those systems. Um, but as it stands, no, we don't. And we rely on the corrosion models to help guide us where are the most likely areas of corrosion damage that are then prepared for inspection with discovery. So unfortunately not, but we are aware of the, the, the sort of magnetometry systems, the long range magnetometry, things like that. But um, we, we, we don't offer those ourselves. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the next one from uh, Roland Barr. Uh, probably this is also uh, just answered, but it seems that uh, the detection uh, level is, is a concern for a few people. Uh, so I'm asking this again, so if you have anything to add, you can. Uh, when performing a rapid scan, what is the detection level? 
with very localized pitting we picked up uh, to trigger a full scan. Uh, yeah, uh, as, as we've said, the, the detection limit crack or crack-like defects cannot be detected with, with this technique. So those, those applications are where you'll, you'll look to use the UT systems. Where we look is, is um, general metal loss, shall we say, and we, we're, we're qualified to detect in all the classes of, of metal loss from pinholes to, to general corrosion, you know. Um, yeah, as we've said about the, the smallest class sort of the pinhole class, that, that anomaly needs to reach a certain depth before it will, be, will appear in the image and will appear in the raw data. Mm -hmm. um, so that's around the depth detection limit is around two mil. There are some limits in the other directions as well. In the axial direction, obviously, I said that our CT slice thickness is 15 millimeters long. That can be shortened, um, but generally it has to meet certain other criteria, the anomaly in the other dire mm -hmm. direction, in the other directions. Um, yes, we have done some trials on flexibles. Um, what's uh, been found is generally in 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 those areas the um, tomography technique or this iteration of the tomography technique is not ideally suited with discovery for flexibles. Um, obviously, looking for cracks in armor wires, disbonding those those are very delicate anomalies that, with our resolution, can become slightly blurred. You know, so generally we're not qualified for flexibles in the same manner that we are for, for rigid steel Ridges. pipes, you know. Okay. Yeah, cheers. Uh, so another uh, couple of questions about the detection limits. Uh, Arjan uh, Koplico is asking, is there a detection limit for the width of the defect? You mentioned the depth of two millimeter. Does it mean that the two millimeter defect needs to be 15 millimeter long to be detected? Um, it doesn't need to occupy the full CT slice um, length uh, axially along the pipe, um, but the less length that it occupies, say that the defect was two millimeters deep and five millimeters long, then the undersize intolerance that becomes less well faithfully created in the uh, recreated in the tomogram and the undersize intolerances can start to occur then so the tolerances start to get a little bit bigger um but it doesn't need to be 15 millimeters long specifically if it is then our standard tolerances will apply if it's shorter than that then the undersize intolerances will get bigger um yes in the uh, i'm trying to think of the other direction so we've got depth if we width is almost like the circumferential direction so yes there's a there's a criteria for width as well and typically we say it needs to be sort of three millimeters wide two millimeters deep 15 millimeters long to meet the standard tolerances you know of, of the standard instrument configuration mm -hmm. thank you uh, the next question is from adcg and during uh, is asking for pipe with a longitudinal uh, seam weld, how would a uh, uh, gauge-like defect present? Uh, would it be correct to say that the scans made are uh, cross-sectional and such uh, multiple cross-sectional scans would have to be stitched together to correctly assess and size the defect? Uh, that's that's correct yeah so as you saw from the 3d model of the one meter sample of pipe that is just a series of 15 millimeter slices through the pipe all stitched together to give you an overall model so we assess each scan so when the scans are coming into the the uh, engineers offshore those are basically assessing the scans one at a time then when we provide the final report the anomalies that are can be clustered together, shall we say, will be clustered together in the defect listing and then an overall anomaly dimension uh, dimensions will be given. So if it is a gouge running along a seam weld, then that will appear as one defect in the defect listing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's the last question for now. Uh,
Samuel Hassari is asking, what are the minimum and maximum pipe size that could be gauged? Yep, so our qualified range, the, the bit where the standard tolerances apply and, and we can pretty much apply our standard analysis configurations, that would be typically six to 24 inch. Um, when you start getting, as you saw, the instrument was a, a sort of general purpose instrument designed to cover the, the widest possible range of sort of upstream flow lines, you know. Um, where the pipes get small, specifically like six inch and below, those are outside the standard qualified range. So we may do project specific calculations on those, uh, calibration, sorry, on those. But we can image down four inch pipes have been imaged before and with project specific calibrations, we have achieved equivalent tolerances, you know. It's just very small images. Um, the smaller pipes tend to get a bit more blurred in the images, as you will have seen from the umbilicals and et cetera that, that were shown in Rob's images. Okay. Uh, but up, up to 24 inch um, pipe with a coating, we can we can fit. Uh, as the has been mentioned earlier in the, the questions, the instrument can clamp onto a, a sample up to approximately 27 inch. Thank you. Just one more question. Let me just add it now uh, by Doya Divine. Uh, how often does uh, pipe inspection take place? Basically, subsea. Uh, yeah, it depends on the application, really. So we do various things from asset integrity. So some operating companies will. Um, utilize the equipment routinely across their range of assets, you know, to do spot checks on their upstream flow lines. Other companies may be thinking of running cleaning pigs or even uh, smart pigs for doing inspections and they'll, they'll deploy discovery beforehand just to see what the condition of the lines like mm -hmm. before they actually risk putting these, these instruments in line or in the case of a cleaning pig, so they know how much debris to expect back in front of the cleaning pig, for example. So sometimes we get used by companies who do routine asset integrity inspections. Sometimes we get deployed on flow lines where there may have been accidents, for example, anchor damage, uh, dropped anchor, for example, may result in someone wanting to utilize us. And then other, other operating companies use us as part of progressive pigging strategies, as I've mentioned, you know, to, to deploy discovery, just to get the image of what's going on inside the pipe before they actually embark on an expensive cleaning regime or even a remediation reg regime. You know, a lot of companies know when they've got a hydrate problem and when these, these situations have occurred. So they'll then use us in sort of an emergency situation like that, where they have failed to start up a, a system correctly and they've unfortunately got a hydrate blockage. So the instruments used in ra uh, ra uh, quite a wide range of applications, but yeah, generally it's more the upstream stuff. Trunk lines we sort of do less of, although we do do some trunk lines and, and transport lines, you know. Great, thank you very much. And uh, I think by that, that was the last question. Thanks again, Ben, for taking time uh, answering these questions in detail. Uh, appreciate it. And thanks, Rob, again, for your uh, very informative uh, and excellent presentation. No problem. Uh, You're welcome. By that, I will hand it over to uh, Ajaz for a few final notes. Just thank you very much. I would like everyone to uh, hold, uh, put their virtual hands together and say thanks to our presenters today and people who have been uh, doing great work behind the scene just to make this happen. Um, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, with that, I would uh, like to, as, as uh, Human has already mentioned, that if you can just rename your uh, uh, name or the tag on the meeting 
would be great because then our organizer can actually match the name with the invitation so that we can actually send out you the survey. So what's going to happen next is that that we will request you to fill in a survey to uh, rate us for our efforts. And if you require any CPD, please send your email address in there back to our organizers and hopefully you will receive your CPD soon in a week or two time. And if you don't receive any survey or any CPD, please contact back to the uh, email address you have received your uh, invitation from. And uh, that would be great. With that, I would quickly share our uh, next event that is going to happen in, um, in in March. And the speaker for our 30th of March 2021 uh, event, ICOR event, is going to be Galvanic Erosion Control of Reinforced Concrete. And the presenter is Dr. George, uh, George Sergei, who is from uh, Vector. And uh, with that, I would like to see you again, hopefully soon in March. With that, I would thank you all uh, for being here with this evening and, uh, and uh, our presenters and the people who have been uh, behind, uh, behind the scene doing all the good work, especially Steve, Amir, and Yunan. Uh, from my co-committee and uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Keep safe and keep well. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you.